coming out on the Saturday and be on the vibe. I'm joined by Ross, lead guitarist of the Commoners. I mean, he's he's been my idol for a long time, and uh, mm. um, you know, Kevin, if you're watching, thanks for doing that. Such a great <laughs> job. He mixed it remotely. He sent it to us. We got on the phone. We talked about it, and uh, you know, it's just an honor to just to hear the way he interpreted it. Mm. And I think that's the biggest thing about working with someone like him is that you know we know what we want to hear, but when you're this close to it, it's tricky to make the decisions that make sense as a foundation. So Kevin was able to sort of pave that for us and come in and go, here is what. I would do with this. Hello. Hey, buddy. Hey, man. How's, How's it, going? it going? Good, man. How are you? Hold on, let me I'm get doing this. well, thank you. That's a very fancy uh, backdrop. You're the you're the first one that's kind of outdone mine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, we got we got a full studio here. <laughs> I know, right? It's pretty impressive, go. man. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on the thing here. Uh, I'm sorry it's just me today. Um, I no, it's cool, that. man. It's cool. Um, I, I was reading up on you. I believe you don't you do mixing for like TV or something and and, and film or something. I was reading up on you the other day. Uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm a music producer full time, but like yeah. my side, my side job was I do a lot of post production for uh, for TV as well. So like I, I have an Emmy actually, and we yeah, won, that's um, yeah, that was the thing I stumbled on, man. I saw the Emmy and I thought, bloody hell, you yeah. know. <laughs> I know. Well. It's, you know, it's interesting because like, you know, it's kind of hard to, to get something like that unless you're working in America. So I do a lot of stuff uh, out of um, the uh, Buffalo, which is like just sort of the closest yeah. American city. So they do a lot of stuff with the Bills and with the uh, the Sabres and all that stuff. So I, I happened to get on a project that, that did something cool. But, you know, it's it's tricky as a Canadian to get it would be hard as a as a, a British citizen, too. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, so but, uh, I mean, as you said, there it's um, like I'm aware you guys are Canadian, and I thought, how on earth have you managed that? <laughs> you know, yeah, like... I got lucky. So you got some, <laughs> some cool, can cool candles going on there. Wait, where, where, oh, we've where got the you? mood light in. Uh, I mean, some guys uh, in the past have wondered whether I'm like serenading them or something. I'm not sure <laughs> quite whether we were going to go that far. But... So I'm here with uh, Ross of the Commoners. Thank you very much for joining me with your fancy backdrop as well. Look at this. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, so I always kind of like to to start things off by taking a look into kind of the early years of a musician. Um, so what kind of first got you into wanting to become a musician? Like, Was, was guitar always like your first kind of love? Yeah, when I, I started taking guitar at the age of five, uh, my parents... I don't know what made them do it, but they, they thought that I had an affinity for it. So they sent me with lessons at the age of five. And, uh, you know, I, you know, we were doing the classical stuff and my guitar teacher who actually is one of my, um, I still work with, with him even now, like uh, on a sort of on a colleague level, I've been I produced mm. a few records of his. And, um, you know, at that point he kind of could tell that I wasn't looking to do classical or looking to do, you know, the, even the jazz world and follow him into that. And so he kind of knew it was rock. So he embraced his rock roots and sort of showed me, you know, the, 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 the classics, you know, Clapton mm -hmm. and, and page and, you know, some of the Hendrix stuff. And, you know, he, he was really showing more of the, the, the fundamentals of rock. And uh, I guess kind of took to that. So I was always sort of pushing away from the classical thing, even though I, I still, you know, did all that. Um, but I was always gravitating towards that. And I remember seeing, you know, the song remains the same by Zeppelin uh, when I was, I must've been 10 or 11. And that's what changed my, my world. I, I said, okay, Jimmy Page is, you know, he's my idol. That's who I want to be, you know? And, and that was sort of my guitar roots was all started from him. Mm. Um, I mean, it's kind of, kind of linked to the next question there. I, th I think everybody growing up kind of always has that, that band that they connect with. It's like their band. I mean, yeah. I, I assume that Led Zeppelin was your band or is, is there another? It was Zeppelin, man. Yeah, it was. Mm. I mean, there was just something about that, you know, just hearing the the way that the four of them could sound bigger than any other band out there. Like, you know, and, and obviously they had their studio magic and whatever. But I, for me, it was always the live records. It was always, you know, the mm. song was the same. And then more recently, obviously. obviously, like the DVD thing that they had with the How the West was one record and all that. Like that was what kind of changed it for me and I, I you know i used to go home from school and put on the song remains the same and play that like that was what i used to used to just like w watch when i came home from school and play along the guitar to that and that was that was like that was my my life for many years after school and 
you know, he's just Jimmy Page was always a big figurehead for me for guitar. And, and of course, Derek Trucks, too, uh, more, more recently with the slide stuff. Like he was mm-hmm. someone who I just really loved the way that he could make the guitar speak in a way that I had never, I'd not really heard that before. He made it sound like a vocal and I, and I, I can't sing. So I was always sort of limited by that. And, you know, and I thought, well, fuck, if I could sing and play, you know, guitar in the same vein, it would kind of answer those questions. Why don't you sing? I go, well, I can sing with the guitar, you know, and the slide mm. kind of made that, that happen. Mm. I, I think that's, that's the thing with a lot of guitarists I hear. Like they, there are guys that maybe as they were growing up, their, their voice has dropped and then they've lost that. But like they, yeah. they find ways to kind of make the guitar their voice in in many ways. You know, it's very much a strong character in a band. I think obviously the guitarist is so like yeah. such an important figure. So for those that don't know, um, how did kind of the the whole Commoners band and everything get together? Like, was there a, a moment? Yeah. So, there? <laughs> well, Chris and I, who's not here, uh, <laughs> Chris and I. <laughs> We we formed the band. Um, we sort of started the thing as a as a project. It was originally sort of his sort of around based around his singer songwriting thing, and then we we sort of realized that hey, we you know we kind of got something with the rock thing, and we we molded that into uh, you know what what would be uh, an, an iteration of what we have now with the two of us. And then mm-hmm. we added Ben, and then once we had Ben as an integral keyboard player and and sometimes pianist. Uh, then we found Adam and, and that's sort of when all the pieces kind of clicked. We, we found Adam and it was like, whoa, we can, you know, we can do anything now. We, once you have a drummer and, you know, I've worked with a lot of bands and when, once you have the right drummer, you know, you can kind of tell that the, the band can do something once the, with the foundation of it is there. So well, once he was in, we were locked. And then um, Miles was, was, you know, he, he was playing in some other projects that we had, had been playing with and stuff that I've worked with here at the studio. And, and he just seemed like a natural fit that we could bring him in on keys. So he was, you know, what we consider the fifth member. And uh, as soon as we had this iteration, that's when the record that you hear now is formed. And, and you know, the, the way that we are as a as a unit now is it really couldn't be the same without the five of us. So, um, you know, this this iteration of us now is what I consider to be the, the formation of the band. Mm. Um, did you always kind of... When, when you guys were, you know, properly formed, did you always kind of have that that real clear classic rock sound? I mean, you guys, from the, from what I've seen of you, of you lot, uh, you have this real kind of strong identity of like, you know, we're this kind of classic rock but modernized kind of band. But what we're trying to do now is, is really just make music that makes sense to us. I don't think we go out trying to say, here's what we want to sound like. I don't think we're saying mm. we want to be a classic rock band or we don't we want to be a, a soul band or, or a rock band like we're, we're looking to kind of make the music that makes us move and makes us dance and feel something you know and um you know obviously bands like the black crows they kind of have that soul rock thing down so there's no no doubt that we you know em- emulate them in a, in a way it comes out when you listen to that music it always comes out in what you're playing but you know we're we're consciously trying to to, to not just be a classic rock band or not just be a soul band or whatever, but we're trying to be sort of this, this obviously rock and roll as the foundation, but we're trying to be this band that we can sort of cover as many things in that rock world without being pigeonholed into classic rock yeah. necessarily, or, you know what I mean? Or blues rock, you know? Mm. Well, wow. I think we dabble in all those spots. That was never the focus to be like one genre, you know? Mm. I, I, I think that's kind of, the big thing that I, I found from listening to you, you know, album, it was um, like, there's not like, obviously there's classic rock in there, but as you said, like there's a bit of kind of blues elements in there. It's kind of, it's, it's like uh, you, you've perhaps put all your influences together and put it in a big melting pot. Like there isn't That's one it. clear band that I could say, it. right. It's definitely them. Well, I think, I think like, like I was saying earlier, I think when you, when you listen to varieties of music, I think when you listen to something a lot, it comes out, and you're playing i think there's any way it couldn't like obviously i i listen to a lot of tedeschi trucks and Derek trucks solo project and that stuff and i uh, i think that ends up coming out in songs like hanging on again and and i won't those those sort of you can feel the the slide guitar elements have been you know nod there's a nod to Derek in there mm-hmm. right and then songs like too much and you know fill my cup like this there's clearly a nod to zeppelin and the crows and you know and, and i think it's it just it that's just what happens when you when you listen to and you grow up with that music you know miles is uh, he grew up listening to you know this 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 soul you know the soul music and the you know anything of like from like the, the band all the way up to 
you know, the classic Joe Cocker and all that stuff. And, mm. and it just comes out like what he's playing. I don't think anyone ever said, this is what you should play as an organ <laughs> player. It's the lines, I think it's just that he just grew up with it. And it just, it just comes out because that's what's, that's what's inside of him, you know? And I think mm. we all do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, with the with the uh, latest album, Find a Better Way. Um, did you guys kind of look to approach that album any differently compared to your, your previous release, like having that extra experience? Well, yeah. I mean, like I said, the the previous release, I don't know if it's really um, a great representation of who we are as a band because we weren't we weren't that band. The band that we were when we put out that that record, it was. Uh, it wasn't the same lineup. It was, mm. it was missing the same, you know, we didn't have like a, a clear line of what we wanted. I think we were all kind of putting out, you know, what we kind of thought people wanted to hear in that world. And then for this record, we kind of said, no, this is, this is who we are. Let's, let's lean into it. You know, let's mm. lean into the, the, the idea of, um, you know, mixing soul rock and, and obviously adding in, you know, elements of, um, you know, just like the, the sort of the common themes that we've talked about in the lyrics and all that stuff. And I think that it was, it had a much clearer direction because we could put our ideas out there and not worry about them being shut down because it was okay if it was whatever. And so like a song like More Than Mistakes lives in the soul world and a song like Too Much lives in the rock world, but mm -hmm. there's a crossover. You can hear, you can see how they both fit on the same album conceptually. And, you know, and, that, and that's cool. I think it's neat that we get both sides of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I noticed obviously on with this album it was mixed by uh, Kevin Shirley. Um, uh, one one song was mixed well, by one Kevin. song. One song That's, was mixed yeah. by Kevin. How did that kind of come about? I mean, I, I know he's obviously a very kind of sought after guy. Yeah, I mean he's he's been my idol for a long time, and uh, mm. um, you know, Kevin, if you're watching, thanks for doing the such a great <laughs> job. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so he's he's in Australia. He's based in Australia now. And, uh, you know, during the pandemic, he sort of opened up his uh, schedule, obviously, because he wasn't able to travel to the States. And a, a large part of what he does is, you know, going to Nashville, going to L.A. and doing records, you know, here and bringing them back to his lair in, in, uh, in Australia and mixing them. And so without being able to travel, he was sort of extending his timeline and schedule to being open to, you know, to, to have, uh, I don't want to say indie bands necessarily, but bands that perhaps otherwise couldn't even get in his schedule for several years uh, mm. the ability to work with him so we had tracked the, the the record at that point and at least at least the one part of it we tracked it and uh i i asked him if he would if he would do it for us he gave us a a, a really great uh rate and um i sent him the songs and uh, this the, the single rather and he he mixed it remotely he sent it to us we got on the phone we talked about it and uh you know it was just an honor to just to hear the way he interpreted it and I think that's the biggest thing about working with someone like him is that, you know, as as the guitar player in the band and then also the one who mixed it, me and the executive producer, uh, Renan, we we mixed the record together. And, and you know, we're we know what we want to hear. But when you're this close to it, it's tricky to make the decisions that make sense as a foundation. So Kevin was able to sort of pave that for us and come in and go, here is what I would do with this. Mm. And once he did that, it was easy for us to sort of uh, not even replicate but use that as a guideline to go okay i see what he's thinking the band is and that's and he's right that's what it should be so he he sort of said the band is this here's my mix here's how i would do it that's the title track and then once he sort of paved that foundation we were able to throw the rest of it uh you know at that mold and um you know i think it i think it translates pretty well from track to track even though you know he's you know at that higher level mm. um i also got to meet him here when he was in toronto uh, right before christmas and uh you know we hung out we had a drink and we got to hang out and he i mean he's he's a legend for a reason man he's he's one of the coolest guys you know out there and he's just his philosophy on life and the way he thinks about things it's just it's that's what that's what makes him good is that he thinks he has a way of thinking that a lot of people can't yeah i think it's experience that gets you there and he, mm. he's got this he's got it down yeah I, I was gonna say there it's like uh you know it's great to just have that experienced figure that can just come in and go right okay i think this this exactly thing, you know because they've been there they've done that you know that it's just great having that that kind of figure around um exactly. uh with the with the two lead, leading singles um find a better way and uh fill my cup um could you talk a bit about those two and kind of maybe how they came together i mean they're, they're obviously very kind of catchy stuff they're getting uh a fair amount of uh, playtime on planet rock 
yeah we're, we're super grateful <laughs> for that by the way too i mean as a canadian band it's it's tricky to you know get radio support outside of your own your own country and the fact mm-hmm. that you guys have jumped on it so much i mean it means the world to me the kind of music i grew up with was all the british invasion so you know from the beatles all the way up to you know the zeppelin and even beyond that in the you know in the 80s stuff and it's like it's just so cool to see that we're you know we're still making music that resonates with where the music we love originated so that was a really cool full circle full circle moment for me Mm. um but those songs i mean find a better way was a great example of a song that was written you know in like like half an hour like we literally literally uh came up with the the riff and and we try to write as a as a band we try to come up with ideas on our own and then we bring them into the band and then it completely transforms so we we usually try not to you know sort of have a song pre-written when mm-hmm. we come together we kind of go here's some ideas and then when we meet those ideas become whatever the direction of the the unit as a band uh it, it takes them in right and so that's what i think most of the songs on the record are there's a few that aren't like that but most of them start with that foundation so find a better way was one where i came in with a riff it's a nice sort of open g riff around around f and g and um i played that and then you know the, the band kind of kicks in and it, it sounds like how it is supposed to and then that's when chris comes up with these lyrics and the the lyrical content for this one was such a, a sort of a take on the world and in the state that we were in at that point i mean this was written right at the, the start of the pandemic like this was you know mm. uh, the first what is it march of 2020 in that area i was you know sort of around then when it was a commentary on what was going on in the world and it, it ended up being quite fitting we didn't even realize some of the stuff that was going to happen in in the world you know even at the point where we'd written it well, we, what we wrote it about at that point was kind of minor compared to what we had what we had beyond that right so um that was what better way was and then after that uh, fill my cup that was a record that kind of came about um how do i even say this we we wrote it with a sort of a different groove in mind we had come up with a riff and then after the riff was was sort of populated we had a chorus that wasn't really doing that hook thing it was a chorus mm-hmm. that was kind of like a almost like a sing-along held note kind of thing with a big massive harmony that swelled in and then a little tag and we played it like that for a while and we workshopped it around and it, and it sort of was falling flat when we played it live and we, we were kind of thinking well what does it need and it needs that anthemic chorus so when we we sort of switched gears and we relooked at how that song could be approached the chorus flipped and changed and all of a sudden it became that sort of throwback with the, the female backing vocal there the gang uh thing the trying on tryings and all of a sudden it became a song that was like anthemic right mm. and i think that's what really brought that that song to the next level you know because the, the verses are cool but it's the chorus that just you know i knew it was something defining you know so uh of course the the up and coming uh co-line a co-headline tour with uh troy redfern kicks off on the 4th of april in london yeah um will this be your your first uk kind of full tour this, this yeah this is the first time that the band is going to the uk um and i i'm sorry to say i've actually only been there one time myself uh, <laughs> okay. and, and it wasn't a really a long time like i really wanted to see london we i was on a stopover on the way to italy and i was like i'm gonna i had a f- six hour layover so i jumped out of the airport and I got on the train and went down and just t- sort of looked around the city for like two hours you know take a couple mm. of pictures and see the see the sights that you could see around the train station and then jump right back and got, got on a plane and it was awesome i mean it was the fall uh, you know, it's very beautiful there in the fall. I walked through Buckingham Palace and came up across to the uh, what's the what's the river there, Th- Thames, whatever. Yeah, the Thames. So, yeah, and I looked around there, and it was it was beautiful. It was everything that I thought London was, and um, that was my really my only experience in the UK. So I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of it. No, it's going to be cool. Uh, I mean, if you don't know Troy, Troy's he's a great guy, really cool, uh, I haven't awesome, had the pleasure of meeting awesome him slide yet. guitarist, ridiculous. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I yeah, haven't had the pleasure of meeting him yet, but I, I know that, I mean, we've heard the singles he's put out and obviously uh, our, our PR guy, uh, Peter Noble, he's a big fan mm. of Troy as well. So we've, we've connected, uh, you know, virtually and mm. uh, I, I have nothing but um, great expectations for how this is going to go. I think it's, I think it's going to be a great pairing. He's a, he's an amazing guitar player and he looks the part too. Like he's, he looks way cooler <laughs> than us, to be honest with you. Uh, got, <laughs> we got to bring our, our cool factor up uh, to match him. <laughs> <laughs> for image. 
I have a running joke about it. He, he looks like some something from like Red Dead Redemption. He's got like yeah. some kind <laughs> of like Western thing going on. <laughs> yeah, but he's got he's got you know he's got the same. So it sort of seems like his style is just like it's what we kind of always want to be, and he's one above it. And we're like, all right, we're gonna, <laughs> where he's going to teach us how to dress over there. I hope that's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, by the end of the tour, you're going to all look like something from like the video game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, of course, when it comes to to playing live, do you have any any kind of particular favorite songs that you always look forward to in a gig? Maybe one for for fans to look out for. I mean, per- personally, I as a, gu- a guitar player, I love um, when we get to hanging on again. Um, this is a song that live. I mean, on the record, it's seven and a half minutes or seven and a bit minutes. Live, we extend it out to nine ish because we do an mm-hmm. intro that intro that's on the record, we kind of, we kind of milk that a little bit more. We make it kind of swirl around and you get this sort of, you know, ethereal feeling before the the track comes in. And then when it comes in, it's, you know, it's one of those songs that at this point, after doing the European tour that we did, I've played it so many times now that it's not really, uh, it's not really different every time because I kind of know what I'm doing. But originally Mm -hmm. that song, when we started playing it it kind of that solo section just ended up being a jam it was kind of like what what do you, what are we going to throw out today you know sometimes it's it's phenomenal sometimes it it would fall a little flat but you know that's probably the part i look forward to the most is kind of going well, how's that jam going to go how's that solo section going to go because you know what to me the best and this is part of watching the song remains the same as a kid it was seeing at moments when you'd see page would start soloing quickly mm. and you'd see bonham and jones would kind of go like all right, he's picking up and they would pick up with him. And you'd see that even from the early days, like the Albert Hall shows uh, all the way up to when you see, you know, Madison Square Garden and then beyond that on the, on the DVD. And you'll see he, he'll start to solo and the band will will catch with him. They'll start ramping with him. Like at the end of Black Dog, you can kind of get a sense mm-hmm. of that too when he picks up in the double time over the solo. And it's something that's like a nod. You can tell that they just kind of stumbled on that. And whether that was something they knew that they were going to try and do and maybe it will work, maybe it won't. But like those unplanned things like that, that's that's what makes the live show so amazing. It's like it's like, what are we going to do? What, what's going to come out of it? And, you know, nine times out of ten, I think it's it's better than the record. And <laughs> and sometimes it's like, you know, oh, well, we missed it a little bit there. We'll you know, we'll we'll recover on the next one. But but <laughs> there's magic. Right. And and when we track the record, I try to I try to do it off the floor. And, and you know, you try to get the band to go down in the moment and capture a moment in time. And that's, what's way cooler about, you know, the old school recording techniques too, is that you, mm-hmm. you, that's how they did everything. All the records that we love were done off the floor. And, and nowadays you don't really get that. So it's, it's cool to even bring that back. And I wonder if maybe that's a part of what's attributed to the success of the songs is that they are, are done in the manner that people that listen to this music would expect, because that's what the, the old guys did the, the, back in the day that's how they tracked it because mm-hmm. they had no other option and we sort of did the same thing and maybe that's that's that little bit of you know ear candy is what you're catching uh when you hear it so i, I don't know but i i those are my moments for sure is when, mm-hmm. whenever that happens <laughs> i i think that's like as an audience kind of a uh, member it's that that's always the stuff that excites me because it, it feels like that's kind of uh even if it is replicated elsewhere, it feels like that's kind of your moment. Like, it's like, I'm never going to see this again. Or like, yeah. you know, whatever happens in this room is is what happens now. And that's it. Exactly. You know, it, it adds that extra magic, as, as you say there. We, we had a show. This is just a <laughs> sort of to, to make a joke out of that, that idea. We had a show <laughs> before the, it was a couple of years before the pandemic. So like, you know, we were still kind of forming the songs as they are now, but we went to mm. play and, for whatever reason, the, the bass player, Ben, his his bass like imploded on him in the middle of the first <laughs> song. It just the pickup like fell into the thing. And like, I don't know why we couldn't fish it out. And he just he literally was unable to play the bass. And, uh, you know, we went with, well, the opening band, we could probably bore their bass. And of course, he was a lefty. So oh, we man. really couldn't we couldn't do it. So we ended up doing a, a show it was like almost like an acoustic show. It was like sort of the, the lead singer, Chris, he was playing guitar. I would sort of join him. And then as the songs would go through, the drummer and the bass player would come up for their respective harmony parts and then go right back down. So it was a show that we never wanted to do, but the people that were at that show got the most unique experience yeah. that they possibly could have. And, and they'll probably not, hopefully that doesn't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. but like, 
that was the only moment where that like he literally the other bass player is like, yeah, you can borrow my bass. Oh, wait, I'm a lefty. Oh, I mean, what so, are the like, odds? Yeah. Play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and sure, the lesson is always bring two bases, uh, you know, which which we, we do now. We travel with them. But that was a, a moment where I think whoever was at that show got mm. an experience. No one will, will hopefully will ever get again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, a question I always like to, to kind of end on uh, that I ask every guest that comes on uh, it's a bit of a hypothetical one uh, if you could tour with one band from the past and one band from the present who would they be a band from the past man I mean I, I think <laughs> I think I'd like to tour with this is probably an obvious answer but I, I would like to tour with the Beatles because I would love to mm-hmm. see how many how loud those fans actually were in those <laughs> yeah you wouldn't hear them <laughs> i would love to see how loud it was because like they you know they stopped touring because they couldn't even they it was so so much attention <laughs> i would love to just experience that and just hang out with those cool cats and see see how they behave off the cameras you know i'd love that would be a really cool experience and a band of today mm. I, I would have to i would love to tour with uh either rival sons or um blackberry smoke because I think I think Rival Sons would be a great band to tour with because they, I mean from what I know of them they're very chill guys and they put on a hell of a show every night and Blackberry Smoke they just seem like they're really just a bunch of awesome southern party guys and I think that would just be a really good time um, and I feel like the camaraderie the brotherhood of both of those bands is is so high and I feel like if you can get into that circle it would be a really great experience because i feel like we have that with our band that we have this brotherhood of like you know as much as we make fun of each other and laugh at each other and whatever that there mm-hmm. is a the foundation of of what we have is so strong it couldn't be rocked you know and i think that's what i see from bands like that like with blackberry smoke um the drummer i'm not blanking on his name right now but um maybe you could put that down here yeah we'll insert <laughs> that. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> his, he, he just got diagnosed with something crazy and he was fighting this illness and you know, obviously they were. I had to take a departure from some shows. They had some subs, and the whole t- Char- uh, Turner, uh, Charlie Turner, I think is his name. But anyway, hmm. um, he he was having, and, and the whole community was supporting him. And uh, Brett Red Turner, Brett Turner, anyway, something like that. But <laughs> but he was uh, he was out, and you know was was fighting this this horrible illness, and everyone was supporting him, and it was just, you could tell that he was a, it was a family. It, it, it was like the brother, our brother was down and we couldn't really continue without him. And like, obviously he's like, you got to make up these dates. Here's a guy that I trust to fill in for me. Mm. Um, but just, you know, just really cool to see the, you know, the, how much they cared about him. And that's, I think we have something going like that. Obviously not for as long as they have, they've been around for some time, but I'd like to think that we, we would have something similar like that in our community. If, if we had, you know, uh, if we ever had to go up against something like that mm, no i get that um on a lighter note that i i do i have heard a few stories from the blackberry smoke lot uh i know a few that have uh, got to support them and they like they like having a good prank so Does if you right? get the chance you've got to be careful of the pranks <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 are... I'm the type that they'll that they'll prank me 100 percent. i'm exactly the kind of person that would <laughs> get agitated by that so that's they're gonna get me for sure if we end up on the road with them. <laughs> there, one, one of our a... hmm? oh sorry i was gonna say one of our label mates uh, bywater yeah. call they're they're uh gonna be playing with blackberry smoke on the blues cruise in the mediterranean right. yeah be so careful gonna, yeah well, I'll, I'll let them know i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a, a story uh it's a band called massive and they on the last night of their support uh the Blackberry Smoke lads thought that it would be hilarious to, on um, all over the stage, like on the amps and everything, uh, they drawed a certain phallic symbol all over the <laughs> over everything. So they came out to uh, everything just covered in this. <laughs> That's great. That's phenomenal. So you've got to be aware of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think it'd be an honor to be pranked by those guys. They're they're, they're the real deal, man. They they know what they know what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank you very much for joining me. And uh, of course, uh, the tickets for the, the co headline tour with uh, uh, Troy kicks off on which kicks off on the uh, 4th of April. 
that's uh, available in the link in the description below. And of course, if you want to go and stream or purchase the the uh, the record, um, it's available as well in the link in description. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, man. It's cool, man. And um, I'll I'll be there last night of the the oh. tour as well. So Great. I'll be in Nottingham. Oh, Robin amazing. Hood country. So, oh, cool. uh, Robin, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Make sure you come. You know Robin Hood. Say. You'll know that one. <laughs> oh, I love Robin. Are you kidding? Well, we've we've probably um, uh, seen the Americanized version of it. I want to. I'm interested in the the original. That's what yeah. I want. No, no <laughs> Kevin Costner here. That's <laughs> right. Not not quite as glamorous. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, we want. That's what oh, I love. That. That's that's great. Yeah, please come come say hi to us. We'll. Uh, we'll yeah, man. Great. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll come down. We'll say hi. We'll have a have a drink. Or something. It'd be cool.